Come on, if you love Jesus, put your hands together in the house. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. He deserves our highest praise in this season more than ever as we reflect on the goodness of God today in worship. I just want to invite you to sing, to give him praise, to honor him today. Because I believe that as we worship, God's going to meet us in a special way. How many of you guys have been reading the one-year Bible and you're kind of getting to the end? Got a little book of Revelation going on. Anybody reading the book of Revelation right now? I don't recommend it, okay? Like we're kind of feeling like 2020 feels like the end times. And then you start reading the book of Revelation, you're like, oh my gosh, we are here right now. It feels a little overwhelming. But I have been reading also the minor prophets. I mean, I remember the Old Testament as it gets into the minor prophets. And they're not minor because of their importance. But many of the chapters are in the books are just one or two chapters. And today's one-year Bible was the entire reading of the book of Haggai. And I was teasing with some of the teams, and depending on what kind of church you grew up in, you say Haggai or Haggai. Come on, say it. look at your neighbor and say it's Haggai. Come on, tell me real quick. I'm just kidding. All right, you can say Haggai if you want to. We'll just make fun of you, all right? Just, uh, just want you, I'm just teasing, just teasing. But Haggai chapter 1 and 2, it says, The remnant of God's people began to obey the message of the Lord. You know, there's power when you begin to obey the message of the Lord. There's great power when you come before Him. It says, The people then fear the Lord. And then God sent this message. Here's the message. He says, I am with you. Come on, think about that. If God is for you, who or what could stand against you? Come on, when they obeyed the message of the Lord and they respected the Lord, he said, I, I'm just with you. And then he goes on to say in chapter two, he says, and my spirit remains among you. So not only does he come right now, but he stays with us. Where God is, his presence goes before us. He's our front guard, our rear guard, the psalmist says. He blesses our coming and our going. So today, as we prepare to sing in worship, I just want you to go all out. Give Jesus your highest praise. Come on, both at home and in the room, would you just bow your head in prayer? Let's begin to worship Jesus. Come on. Come on, let's begin to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today, to give you praise that only you deserve. And so God, as we sing and as we give you honor today, God, I pray your presence would fill our lives as we worship with everything we have today. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, church, we all shouted amen together. Amen. Come on, amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together like this. Let's worship God. There's nothing that a God can't do.
faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Come on. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Every voice. Let faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. One more time. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that. Three. 
Jesus. Come on, celebrate him. Come on, both at home and in the room, would you take just a moment to close your eyes? If you're comfortable, maybe open your hands or lift them before the Lord. In this season where there is so much stress and anxiety and the hustle and bustle of everything that's required begins to pull us out, the thing that we need the most is Jesus. And his promise from Haggai is that he would be with us, that he would walk with us. Come on, just let it turn to worship, honoring him. I want you to sing, I love you, Lord. and worship him and I lift my voice to worship you oh my soul rejoice take joy celebrate him and his goodness we worship you Jesus it's doing like you Lord come on join me in prayer at home and in the room Heavenly Father we recognize that what we need more than ever is your presence and your grace in our lives and God as we walk through this season trying to end one year that has so many overwhelming pieces to it and begin a new year as we go through this time with our families and our loved ones, I pray that your presence would go in every conversation. God, that your presence would just speak to us and give us hope and words to speak to others who are going through this season with us. God, I pray that we would have love in our hearts like never before to worship and to lead others to a life-giving relationship with you. God, we thank you for this time today. We pray that you meet us in a special way. In Jesus' mighty name. We all said amen together. Amen and amen. One more time, let's celebrate Jesus and his goodness. I want to encourage you. This is something my wife's been saying to me. We've been married for 17 years, and all 17 years, she's been telling me how much she loves Christmas music, how much she loves the Christmas season and the songs. And I got to tell you, just in the last three, four, five years, it's starting to grow on me. I don't know why. Some of those old Christmas songs, I just like, ah, could take them or leave them. But you know what I'm finding in this season is just not only a greater love for the family time and the fun that comes with some of these songs, like uh, Santa got run over by a reindeer. Come on, everybody right? Can't, can't miss that one. 
But listening to like the song we sang today and hearing the gospel message through the songs of breaking oppression, of breaking chains, of bringing freedom, that the slave is my brother. I love that line in the song that even in the early church, as we were singing songs and remembering the birth of Jesus, we were sharing the gospel and the change that comes by knowing Jesus. And as I've been listening more and more and more, she's been getting in the truck and she says, oh, you really love me. Did you put this on just for me? And I said, no, I'm actually starting to like it too. Right? You, you rubbed off on me a little bit more than you think, right? And in this season, I just want to encourage, I know there's lots of things to be concerned about. How am I going to pay for this? And what's going to happen in the new year? And is the job going to be? And, uh, and we could list those things out. But how about for just these last few weeks of the year, we focus all our attention on the birth of our Savior and the great work that He did in our lives. And I think if you do that, you'll sense His presence. And when the hard conversations come and the stress comes, what you'll find is like, oh, I've got something on the inside that speaks to this situation. And when the family turns on the Christmas song and they're just kind of singing it to sing it, you're over here remembering the gospel message of Jesus Christ being proclaimed in every home. Think about it. It's the one time of year where the gospel message is being proclaimed and some of them don't even know it's the gospel. God is reaching out to every heart. I'm telling you, it's a great season, a great year to be alive. Because listen, when challenges increase, our Savior, His grace and His strength increases in our lives. His saving work is expanding and growing, and we're seeing that happen in our church and our family. And so if you are with us for the very first time in this holiday season, we like to say hello. Come on, One Hope Church, put your hands together for our first timers. We're glad you're here. Come on, both at home, in the room with us today. We've got a great time prepared for you. The preacher's amazing. It's not me, it's someone else. Get ready, get ready, get ready. It's gonna be a great time. But I also just wanna remind you of what's happening. We have two services on Christmas Eve, candle lighting services. You wanna come and enjoy this with your family. 3.30 p.m., 5 p.m., 3.30 p.m., 5 p.m. Make one of those. It's gonna be an incredible time. And then the 27th, so next Sunday, everything is online only. I've got a special message for that Sunday, the 27th, about how to end some things well. If you end well, you can always begin the next season well. And I'm going to share that with you as we get ready to kick off the new year with 21 days of prayer. Come on, we're doing 21 for 2021. Y'all with me, all right? How many of y'all know we need a little more Jesus in the new year? 21 days prayer and fasting, not prayer and feasting. So the feasting is between now and then, all right? Get ready, because on the third, we're going to cut some pounds, everybody, all right? And we're going to get closer to Jesus. That's the goal. It's going to be a great time. And so before we jump into the news, I'll be back to tell you a little bit more about what's coming. But uh, take 30 seconds, say hi to somebody you don't know, and then grab your seats. Welcome to church. My name is Morgan, and we are so glad you decided to join us today. If you've joined us in person, you can see that our facility has been prepared with your safety and enjoyment in mind. However, church does look a little bit different as we continue to practice social distancing. Parents, One Hope Kids is now open for your kids to enjoy. However, if you feel more comfortable keeping your children with you, you are still welcome to bring your children in the auditorium, or you can enjoy service in our mother's room for moms and infants. We are also streaming this service in our lobby where there is plenty of seating and free coffee. If you'd like to give financially as an expression of your worship to God, check out one of the four ways on the screen right now. Now remember, our giving is worship to God and is making an internal impact. Lastly, if you wanna learn more about membership, serving others, or connecting in a deeper way, you can attend Next Steps on Sundays at 1030. For more information about anything happening around One Hope, you can visit onehopechurch.com or text One Hope to 94253. Well, that's all for me. Let's get ready for today's message. 
All right, go to onehopechurch.com. If you haven't done it already, you'll find lots of information about our church and what we're doing. We're actually gonna brighten the room up in just a moment because we got some hazy skies going on outside. But I, I wanna also just tell you one other thing so I want you to be aware before the lights come on that you don't rush to jump, okay? Okay, it's coming come, come in just a minute. But I also wanna make you aware that many of you have asked and we've kind of been talking a lot about our Heart for the House offering. That's still available if you'd like to give small or great. It doesn't matter the amount. Every Everything we do is making a difference together. You can do that all the way through the end of the year. So as you're kind of considering your year in giving, could I ask you to consider One Hope Church? and the difference we're making together. And if you missed last weekend's Heart for the House message and you're wondering what we're doing, I would encourage you to watch probably at least the first 15 minutes. You might wanna watch the whole thing because I, I was preaching a pretty good message last week. I'm just kidding, all right? But uh, if you wanna watch the first few minutes, you'll see the 16 areas that we specifically have been investing in for the last six years and beyond those. And so I just wanna invite you to be a part of that. Now today, I'm excited for you to hear God's word. I'm excited to hear it myself because I haven't heard the message a few times a year, she's willing, comes and says, hey, I feel like God's spoken something to me to share with you. And so would you put your hands together for the first lady, my wife, Amber, she comes to share God's word. Thank you, thank you. Well, hello, One Hope. I'm so glad to be back with you today. I say to be back because I think the last time we said that I was up here on a Sunday was pre-pandemic. So that feels about two years ago. So I'm glad to be back with you today, both online and in person. It's always my great joy to get to share God's word with you. Today I'm sharing a message called The Meaning of the Holidays. And can I tell you, just like my husband kind of told on me a minute ago with the Christmas music, I love the holidays. I love the sights, the sounds, the smells, the tastes, the drinks. I'm one of those people that Chick-fil-A emails me that their holiday shake is coming out and I'm like, thank you. Thank you, Chick-fil-A, for prioritizing my needs this season. So I just love it, I love all of it. And you know, in preparing for this message and studying the Bible, I was pleasantly surprised to find that God loves the holidays too. You know, that's an aspect I really hadn't thought much about. I think a lot about God's grace, his love, his truth. But in studying the Old Testament, I was like, wow, God really put in place a lot of holidays or special days, some say festivals or feast days, for his people. And these weren't just suggestions, they were actually mandates from the Lord to observe these days year in and year out. And you know, when I think of festivals, I'm reminded of our great city of New Orleans that um, pandemic notwithstanding has over 120 festivals a year. And I thought, wow, look at New Orleans being kind of modeling after the Bible a little bit. Who knew, you know? I also thought further proof that God really loves a special day celebration is that God loves a shared meal. We see this theme all throughout the Bible too. In fact, a few weeks ago, Josh and I were taking the kids through the book of John, I think it was, and we were listening to it audibly. And he said, you know, what have you all noticed? What have you noticed from these chapters in John? And I said, you know, one thing I noticed is the theme of eating and drinking. How important it is what we put in our bodies, who we share a meal with. And so this is further evidence that God loves a special day celebration and also further evidence that New Orleans, once again, is modeling itself after God and loving a good meal shared together. You know, I say that kind of joking, but we see examples of this in the Bible. Take the Last Supper, for instance. What did Jesus do? He shared a meal around the table with his disciples. Also in the Old Testament, we see how important the Passover meal was. You know, God had a lot of instructions on how they were to celebrate that holiday. And in preparing for this message, I started to reread a book that our pastor in Birmingham wrote called The Four Cups. And this book actually goes through the Passover meal and shows us four things that are really special and really purposeful for us represented in this meal. And what Pastor Chris says in the book is that this meal was kind of toasted or ended with a sip from a cup. 
But that cup had a name and a meaning and a purpose for our lives. And so I see this theme all throughout the Bible that God thinks it's important for us to celebrate a holiday with purpose and with meaning. And so today I'm excited to share this message with you because I thought if God loves holidays and many of the elements of holidays are enjoyable to us, why do we need to even talk about the meaning of holidays? I think you probably know the answer and it's simple. It's that even though there are elements that we all love and enjoy, there also are some negative feelings sometimes associated with that. Josh mentioned that this morning. You know, I had a friend over for coffee the other day and she said something kind of surprising to me. She said, you know, this season always carries a little bit of anxiety for me. And I thought, wow, I didn't ever see it from that perspective. But you know, I have other friends that this holiday season, they're celebrating it without a loved one for the first time. And that brings a sadness that many of us are familiar with. And then like Josh said earlier, there's just sometimes the pressure of gifts and extra things on the calendar. And so I think it's important for us today to really come back to the meaning of holidays. See, when we think the holidays should be one way and then our expectations aren't met, we're left with disappointment. And I don't think that's God's goal for any of our holiday celebrations. Dr. John Maxwell, he shared a Christmas message recently, and he said this, we get disappointed when we're following a star and we find a stable. You know, I think that happens to all of us, and actually it happened to a lot of folks who were involved in the very first Christmas. Plenty of people had unmet expectations because they were Jews who had been reading the promises of a Messiah for a long time dating back generations. And then they were disappointed when Jesus showed up on the scene in a stable because it wasn't what they were expecting. And it even caused them to doubt, is this really the Messiah? So you see, our expectations, especially on holiday celebrations, have a lot to do with how we're going to experience the holiday. You know, today our disappointments with the holidays sound a little bit different. I don't think we literally think, oh, I was following a star and I found a stable. But maybe it sounds like this. Man, they left me out of the planning of that event. Or maybe I wasn't invited to that celebration at all. Maybe for your kids, you've heard this before. It's disappointment. Man, I didn't get what I wanted. (laughs) My kids are actually literally counting gifts under the tree right now. How many am I getting? You know, also, I think a common disappointment in our holidays is often something like this. Man, my family acted a fool at dinner. Can I tell you guys, though, relax. This is not unique to the holidays. Your family has probably been acting a fool all year long. But the thing is, we put so much expectation on the holidays. And so... With that in mind, I wanted to just remind us that, you know, we have a really great privilege of perspective. And this is the privilege of perspective that I believe that we have. You see, our friends in the Old Testament, they had prophecy of a coming Messiah. The Bible says they saw dimly through a glass. And then when we read about our friends in the New Testament, like I just shared, they had the prophecy and then they had this baby in a stable And they had a real leap of faith in believing that this was the Messiah. But we, in the modern day church, we have the great privilege of perspective of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we see the written prophecy, and then we see the historical account of Jesus and what he did for us. And friends, that should give us such a great privilege of perspective, and it really should help us to focus on what the holiday is really supposed to mean. So what should we do if we're gonna find the true meaning of the holiday? I think the first thing we need to do is we have to actually redefine the holidays. Now we're right in the middle of the Christmas holiday, but this also applies to all of the other holidays that we celebrate throughout the year. You know, I read an interesting article and it was talking about this debate of like people not wanting to say Merry Christmas and instead they say Happy Holidays and I don't know, If you're offended by that, then I have to kind of confess that you might be offended by something that I do also, and that is I just like to shorten text. Does anybody else like to shorten text messages? 
Okay, a few of you. So I know this is probably sin, but I actually shorten Merry Christmas in my text messages to Merry Xmas. Is anybody offended by that? <laughs> I think a few of you are, but you're just not being honest. <laughs> But this article, it was talking about the significance of the words happy holidays. And it said that holiday has gradually come to mean just any special day set aside for leisure or celebration. Just any day we decide we're setting aside. And don't you know that's true? Like, do you have that calendar setting on your calendar app in your phone that tells you every holiday? Like, the other day it was like, today is National Greeting Card Day. I'm like, what? Every, anything we want can be a holiday. You know, I mentioned our city and all the festivals that we celebrate earlier. And do you know that one of the days that New Orleans celebrates is a festival of naked bike riding? <laughs> That's a thing. It's like a special day to celebrate. So I think we totally have done this. We, our culture has just come to have any special day set aside for our leisure or our celebration to be a holiday. But this word holiday actually originates in an old, actually two old English words. And those words are halig dag. And that means holy day. And y'all, this hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, why haven't I ever seen this before? A holiday in its origin is supposed to be a holy day, a day set apart. I think a lot of our holidays haven't quite become that. But Christmas is a great opportunity to celebrate a holy day. You know, the article went on to say, don't be offended then if people want to tell you happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas because they're really wishing you a happy holy day. So now I just breathe a sigh of relief. I'm happy for any holiday greeting. You know, I see in scripture two ways that we can redefine the holidays. And the first is this, we can redefine holiday as a celebration of what God has already done. You know, I mentioned the Passover celebration. Maybe that's something that you could start to celebrate around the Easter holiday or holy day. What they ate and drank in that, in that holiday was a celebration of what God had already done for them. You see, God's people were enslaved in Egypt for many, many years but God delivered them from that situation. And even though God sent many terrible plagues on the Egyptian people during that time, the last most deadly plague, God's people were spared from. They were passed over if they put the blood of a lamb on their doorpost. What a great thing to celebrate. What a great thing to remember, something that God has already done for them. And so in this Passover meal, even the bread has significance. You know, the matzah bread, it is unleavened bread. And that's a reminder to them when they eat it that they, they were taken out of Egypt quickly, so quickly that even their bread didn't have time to rise. And like I said in my pastor's book, the four cups, the cups that they drink from in that meal to seal that meal have significance of what? Of things that God has already done for them. You know, in reference to Christmas, I wanted to share a few verses of things that God has already done for us that should be our focus of celebration during the season. And the first is in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. This is a prophecy in the Old Testament. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Friends, I hope during this Christmas holiday season that when you're sitting around your Christmas tree about to open your presents, that you sense the presence of a wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace. I hope that when you share gifts with your family and your friends, it's just an overflow of the goodness of God and a celebration of what he has already done. Earlier in that chapter of Isaiah, it says this in verse one through two. Again, a prophecy. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in great darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. 
what a great thing our God has done for us. We were dead in the darkness of our sin and God shared with us his precious son, Jesus, the light of the world. These are the things and the focus that our holidays should be about. You know, I mentioned how we have this great privilege of perspective, and if you wanna see that in scripture even, you can go on to read later Matthew chapter four. It says the same thing that Isaiah chapter nine says. It describes Jesus being in this place by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles, and it goes on to say, so that the prophecy may be fulfilled that they that were in darkness would see a great light. I love the perspective that we can have on the holidays. The second thing we can do to redefine the holidays is we can define it as an opportunity to share Jesus with the world. Wait, you mean it's not just an opportunity to get more stuff? It's not just an opportunity to to cook your favorite casseroles and to see your aunts who you haven't seen in a year? No, it's also an opportunity to share Jesus with the world. You know, we've done this a lot as a church this holiday season, and I'm so proud of each and every one of you. From those of you in small groups who pack shoe boxes to go overseas to children in need, you know, those shoe boxes were packed with an organization that will share the gospel message of Jesus with the children who receive it. We did this also in our Serve Saturday recently where we provided gifts for families in foster care. Why? so that we might reach into their hearts in a time of need and have an opportunity to share Jesus. Josh mentioned our Heart for the House offering last week. We shared 16 ways that we reach outside of ourselves, not just to meet a need, but with the hopes of being able to share Jesus. This is what our holidays, our holy days should be about, celebrating what God has already done and sharing Jesus with the world. Matthew 5, 16 says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That is my heart's desire, and I hope that's your desire too, not just for Christmas, but for every day and for every special day. When we hold to this new definition, there's very little room for disappointment. See, God has already done the good work for us, We have the privilege of perspective. Now the ball's in our court. We get to celebrate the holy days in order to share Jesus with the world. Now, we have to redefine in order to to really uphold the meaning, the true meaning of the holidays. But after we redefine, I see a second thing that's important for us to do, and that is this. We must protect the holidays. Have you ever thought of it this way? Maybe you haven't, but maybe you've experienced a holiday that was not protected, where the good things just seem to go out of the window, and all of your hours of preparation were met with maybe ungrateful children or maybe some family drama, and you were like, what is the point? What was this all for? Well, see, if our expectation is just for a good meal, or a drama-free day, or grateful children, we might face disappointment. But if we really want the goal to be to celebrate what God has done and to share Jesus, it's gonna take some effort for us to protect that goal. We have to protect the true meaning. As I was preparing, I kept hearing this line and I asked them to put it on screen. There's nothing less fulfilling than a day that's supposed to be about remembering what God did for us becoming all about materialism and family drama. You know, I have to confess, sometimes I think to myself as I'm buying all the gifts and I'm wrapping them, is this too much? Am I really hitting on the true heart of Christmas? And don't get me wrong, it can become too much, but what helps me is to remember that me giving a gift is truly a desire to be a reflection of what God gave to me. And I think if we keep that at the heart of things, you're safe to keep buying gifts and wrapping them and putting them under the tree. Please don't stop doing that. But we don't want it to become about something it was never supposed to be about. So how do we protect the holidays? Once you've defined a holy day in a way that you feel is honoring to God, how do we actually protect it? 
Pastor Josh always likes to give us some practical steps, things you can do on Monday and Tuesday. And let me tell you, Christmas is coming on Friday, so you need to be doing these things on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Two things that I think we can do to protect the holy days. The first is this, and it's simple, but it's not easy. Set boundaries. Set boundaries. Take some time to think about what a holy day should look to you, and then take some time to really think, how can I practically accomplish this with my family this season? How can I practically accomplish celebrating what God has done? How do I practically accomplish not letting it become about materialism? And how do I practically share Jesus? You know, boundaries, simply put, keep the good things in. That's all. It's not complicated. Boundaries keep the good things protected. You know, we don't need to really look any further than God, our creator, and how he created the world to see that he is a God of boundaries, that he loves boundaries. I wanna read a passage to you from Genesis chapter one. It'll sound familiar to you, but I wanna emphasize a few words that maybe you didn't think of before. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. Light's a good thing. And there was light. God saw the light was good and he separated a boundary. He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault, another boundary. Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and so it was. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters, he called them seas, and God saw that it was good. The good things were protected in their place. I think we can all agree, um, let me try not to say these words, but I'm gonna say them anyway. 2020, the cone of uncertainty, you know, how bad that was, how awful that was. I think we can all agree that when there's a threat of waters breaking their boundaries onto dry land, that it causes all of us to get a little worried, why? because the good things won't be kept in their places. This holiday season, it's important that we have boundaries to protect what the holy day is really supposed to be about. Okay, so we talked about being practical. So I would imagine that your question might be, okay, Amber, what should my boundaries be? Well, here's the thing, they're personal to you. Your family is unique, it has its own sets of drama, Drama that my family doesn't have, but my family has its own drama too. So your boundaries will be unique to you. It's gonna require some time of prayer and reflection on what your holidays should look like. Now I can share with you some examples though of things that we've done throughout the years in order to have good, healthy boundaries for the holidays. When our kids were really young, we quickly realized that to drag them to three different places on one day was going to really mean that they would end up with a lack of nap and then they would start acting out and then our family would probably wonder, um, are these kids possessed? Like, that is not an ideal situation for sharing Jesus with anyone. So we realized in order for them not to be just a hot mess and for us to be frustrated, that we needed to set some time boundaries and some location boundaries on our holiday so that it could be a holy day of celebration. And so for a while, we spread it out over a couple days, a few different families family celebrations, and that brought us so much peace. It gave us the margin to be able to really celebrate with each family what God has done for us and to share the love of Jesus when our kids weren't throwing a fit. So that was a really good boundary. You know, some people have boundaries about alcohol consumption during the holidays. 
You know that there's those family members that when you get into that political conversation, especially if you've had too many drinks, it's gonna go downhill really quickly. And so I have a lot of friends who after many painful, dramatic holiday experiences with their family members have decided, you know, I now have a drink limit on my holidays. I need to be of sound, clear mind so that I can steer myself around those things that aren't going to be beneficial. You know, I have one friend who right now is having to have a really tough boundary. They have a family member that actually has been very, um, just tearing them down every time they see them. And unfortunately, this holiday season, they've had to put the boundary in place of not seeing that family member. But you know what I encourage this friend? Is that boundaries don't always have to stay the same. Boundaries are there to keep the good things in place and to allow the good things to grow. So if you have to have a hard, healthy boundary with someone who has been hurting you, let's hope that a little distance and the heart of Jesus will help that person to grow, that maybe next year you can change the boundary line a little bit. You know, when our kids were little, where'd we put them to sleep? We put them in a crib. That crib, the boundaries kept them safe and allowed them to grow. But eventually they grew out of that crib and now they sleep in a regular bed. And now our boundaries look like things like healthy screen time and private passwords. And, and those are boundaries that are helping them to grow. So a boundary doesn't have to stay the same. It just needs to stay in place long enough for the good thing to grow. I hope that helps you this holiday season. So now that we've set the boundaries, the second way we protect our newly defined holiday is simple. We keep the boundaries. See, when we pray over something and we give it careful thought and God speaks to us and gives us healthy boundaries, then it's up to us to commit to what God has shown us. I like the way Proverbs 4.26 says it. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and then be steadfast in all your ways. Be steadfast. Trust that God has shown you a way to celebrate a holy day and stick to it. I hope this message today has given us the opportunity to really give some careful thought. Because maybe you're like me and at times in your life you feel like you're just kinda swept up in the seasons of the year or maybe you're just swept up and like taken along for a ride with each holiday that comes. It's like, okay, we celebrated Easter. Now it's already 4th of July. And now we're going into Thanksgiving and it's already Christmas. You know, we say it every year. It's like, man, it feels like it was just January. And so instead of living a life of just being swept up in the cycles of the year or the cycles of holiday, my goal for us today is that we really take some time and we think about and we pray about, God, what are the holy days that you want me to, separate, to, to set apart? You know, maybe for some of us, this message is a little convicting. Maybe we've been like the city of New Orleans and celebrating two and a half festivals a week and one of them's the naked bike ride and we realized, you know, <laughs> this really is of no value to me and to my family and to my life. So maybe there are some days that we've been pouring a lot of energy and money and time into, and we realize they don't have the elements of celebrating what God has done for us and an opportunity to share Jesus. And so I realized that there might be an element to this message that's convicting. And I think that's okay. You see, I think God sends conviction to steer us closer to Him. I think more than anything, just like God in the Old Testament mandated his people to remember these feast times, these festival times, I think he's wanting to mandate it for us too because God loves a good meal. He loves sharing time with friends and family. You know, we, we mentioned the Last Supper. What did he say to his disciples? Don't stop doing this. Continue to do this in remembrance of me. Continue to have my body and my blood be a part of your monthly, weekly, daily celebrations. God's heart is not to suck the life out of our celebrations. His heart is for us to celebrate the holy days. 
And I hope today that you have some fresh ideas and insight and motivation to do just that. You know, in closing, I wanted to take just a moment to talk to anyone who might be listening online or here in the room, maybe for the first time. You know, and maybe you're like, Amber, you've just totally wrecked my idea of the holidays because I thought it was about my aunt's sweet potato pie (laughs) and gifts, and now I'm having to rethink a few things. Well, praise God for quiet moments to rethink the course of our lives. So if this message has been new to you today, and maybe you find yourself in a place where you're far from God, and you realize that even in your everyday life, you're not taking time to celebrate what God has done, because maybe you haven't received what God has done for you. I'd love to take just a minute to pray with you. Would you all bow your heads with me and close your eyes? If that's you, and today you realize that you've been missing a major point of life, having a relationship with Jesus. I wanna do what we talked about in this message. I wanna take a moment to share Jesus with you. If you've been carrying the weight of your own sin and you know that you are not okay on your own, but you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, it is so easy for you to get close to him today. It's as simple as believing in him and expressing that faith with a heartfelt prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you to the front, but if today you would like to invite Jesus into your heart, I would love to lead you in a prayer. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let this prayer be your prayer. Dear Jesus, I accept what you did on the cross for me. I believe that you died to pay the penalty for my sins and mistakes. And today I recognize that I need you to cover me in your grace and your mercy. I need your forgiveness of sins. And Jesus, I want to start a life with you today filled with hope and joy for the future. Today I surrender my life to you, Jesus. I commit to learn more about you each day, and I pray that you would give me the power to follow you all the days of my life. Now, as we continue in prayer, God, I pray for every person listening to this message today. God, I pray that you would stir our hearts throughout the week, that the holidays are actually holy days. And God, I pray that you would speak to us clearly on how to set boundaries to protect those days. God, I pray that you would give us opportunities to share Jesus with our family and friends as we meet this week. And God, I pray that as we do, that you would receive all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in our celebrations. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all said together, Amen. Amen and amen. amen. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Let's pray for those. Come on, clap for those who made a decision for Jesus. What a great choice. It's the best choice of your life to surrender control to Jesus, to invite him in to be Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer of decision, would you text my decision to 94253? We want to send you some next step information to help you grow in your faith. Listen, it's a very, very important step that you go beyond the prayer. Because listen, prayer is the beginning place of the expression of your faith, but then you begin to take next steps. We told you about one of those earlier. Our next step classes today is at 1030, and we prepare the beginning classes for you. It's not the end all, it's the begin all. So no matter where you are in your faith, you just take the next step in front of you and you keep growing. And we'll help you grow towards maybe being water baptized one day and going public with your faith. We're gonna help you to take this time and really get ready for the beginning of the new year to start fresh, all right? So next steps are so important. Do the first one, text my decision to 94253. A couple of quick reminders. If you came prepared to give, as we talked about earlier, there's some boxes at the, uh, the doorways as you go out. If you'd like to give online or text to give, that's available for you. Remember our heart for the house. And then also a couple of other announcements. 
next Sunday. All services are online. Christmas Eve, 3.30 and 5 p.m. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you're coming. I know you are. We're going to light a candle together, okay? It's going to be a great time. Uh, Heart for the House, I said that. And then on January 3rd, we're beginning 21 days of prayer. And so have some fun in this season. But I want you to start preparing your heart and your mind for how you're going to begin 21 days of prayer and how you're going to begin 2021 differently than you began this year. So would you stand with me? We're going to pray over our offering together, and then we're going to go and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, as we give to you today, I pray that you would bless it back to us in tremendous ways. God, as we invest in others and as we serve our families, I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom in this season. Thank you for your generosity in our lives, and thank you for the ability to carry it forward into other people's lives. God, we thank you for our holy days and ask for your presence to go with us today, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we all shouted amen together. Amen and amen. Let's clap as we go. God bless you. We'll see you on Christmas Eve.